This is Dr. Bill Mounts in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. This is session number 5 on Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 through 20 on Jesus and the Law. Okay, we went through uh, the first part of the chapter 5 at a snail's pace, but we had to. Uh, it establishes so many basic uh, themes and approaches. So today we're going to speed up and do a whole other half a chapter. <laughs> um, and this is the uh, whole issue of Jesus and his understanding of the law. Um, and so we're going to go from 517 to the uh, end of chapter 5. If we get done really early, we'll, we'll, we'll look into chapter 6. Or since Frank's not here, we may get out early. But uh, this this talk generally takes all day. There's so many uh, thorny issues that come up in the exegesis. Okay. The Jewish leaders, at least we're at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the Jewish leaders' uh, primary question about Jesus probably was, what does he think of the Old Testament? What does he think of our interpretation? Here's this new, unknown, charismatic teacher coming out of the, of the uh, Hicksville. Uh, it hadn't gone to any of their schools. Uh, nobody really knew about him. There had been some weird stuff that went on in Jerusalem. And uh, something about Cana and really good Malbec wine. I'm sure it was Malbec. Okay. No Chardonnay. It had to have been a Malbec. Anyway, um, and they're going to be wondering, what does he think about the Old Testament? Because that's, that's the central uh, question. It's the defining document of Judaism. Does Jesus accept its authority? Does Jesus accept our understanding of it? I mean, all these questions were most certainly going around in their head. And so Jesus anticipates the question right up front. And he says, do not, so 517, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So the Jewish leaders are going, okay, he's, he's not going to try to get rid of it, but they probably, to fulfill them, kind of, hmm, who does he think he is? That's, that's an odd thing to say. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, the iota, and not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. The Pharisees are going, yeah, well, good, good, good. And therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments, not, not the, I'm not even talking about the major commandments, I'm talking about the little stuff, the, the tithing of the, of the mint kind of thing, and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus primes the pump and gets the discussion going by kind of lulling them into what turns out to be a false complacency. So that's what's going on at the, at the beginning of this passage. In other words, he's saying that I and my teachings are going to be uh, in complete continuity with the Hebrew Scriptures, the Law, and the Prophets. Uh, technically, the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Scriptures are, are the Tanakh, uh, Torah, Nevi'im, Kethivim, so the Law and the Prophets. Uh, we don't know when the Jews closed the canon on the writings part. You know, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, wherever that goes, you know, some of those questions. Probably the end of the first century A.D., but by law and prophets, that part of the canon was closed. And uh, by saying the law and prophets, Jesus is, is in fact talking about our entire uh, Holy Scriptures. All right? So law and prophets, and in other words, what we call the Old Testament. The key issue on the verse, though, and the, the issue that probably would have kind of perked up their ears and go, what does that mean? Is the word fulfill. I'm going to talk about it. I think this issue is the 
most difficult theological issue in the Bible. The relationship of the Old and the New Testament. In what sense does Jesus fulfill? Uh, in what sense is the Old Testament still valid? In what sense is the Old Testament not valid? We read the Psalms and there's no question. We love them and we quote them and we preach on them. Uh, but very few of us have probably stoned disobedient son. Probably very few of us have, have killed a gay person, right? Uh, Old Testament laws, right? And so what we tend to do is kind of pick and choose what we like, right? Well, this makes sense, so I'm going to follow it. And this other stuff, this doesn't make sense, so I'm not going to preach on stoning a disobedient son. Um, although from where I am, you can stone a disobedient son really easily. <laughs> I'm going to let this sit for just a second. You just go down to the local store and buy some pot and you give it to your son because it's all legal now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's, I'm just waiting, waiting Pacific Northwest, really the, the avant-garde part of the nation. <laughs> well, the, uh, you know, that's a big interesting conflict between Washington and Oregon because Oregon sees itself as this ultra-progressive state and they legalize pot, but the, the feds don't like it, but you still, you, they still have to grow it in hidden places, and then Washington beats them to the punch and legalizes marijuana completely. And uh, Oregon, I'm sure, was chagrined and quickly passed a law that they too will allow uh, this. You can also walk naked in Portland if you want, by the way, both Portland and uh, San Francisco. Uh, nice laws. Anyway. Yeah, that when the law passed in San Francisco, I'm really getting off topic in a hurry. You know, you can literally walk naked according to the city statutes in, in uh, San Francisco. The only requirement is if you sit down, you have to sit on a towel. Anyway, anyway. Fulfill, I don't know how I got into, oh, stoning a disobedient son. Okay, all right. Um, this, this issue is a difficult issue. I, I've, I've read books. I've, I've had private times with Tom Schreiner. This is his specialty. And it's still a difficult. So rather than focus so on all the things I haven't figured out, uh, there are some things that at least I'm comfortable having settled on as to what fulfills means. So let's, let's walk through that. Then I'll tell you where kind of those, the, the questionable issues are. What does it mean when Jesus says he fulfills the Old Testament, what's the relationship of the New and the Old Testament? Jesus fulfills the Old Testament in that all of it points to him and all of it finds its fullest and most complete meaning in him. So the Old Testament has this, starting in probably Genesis 11, has this very broad base and it starts in the story of Abraham and a little before that. And it's slowly moving to a point, to a pinnacle. And that pinnacle is Jesus. So all of the Old Testament points to him in one way or another. All of it points to him. And all of it finds its fullest meaning, its deepest meaning in him. Are you familiar with um, Graham Goldsworthy's material? He uh, is the theological guru behind Moore College in Australia. And he has done a really good job at helping us see Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament. You know, typical academic qualification. I don't think Jesus is. He's not behind every rock in the Old Testament. Um, and I think you can preach the Old Testament and stay in the Old Testament. But... Uh, Goldsworthy has given us a new sensitivity to realizing that all of it ultimately, one way or another, is pointing to Jesus. And it, it makes for effective preaching. Anyway, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament in all that it, and in that all of it points to him and all of it finds its fullest and most complete meaning in him. Okay, let's, let's look at some of the specifics. Number one, Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecies. This is, this is the easiest one, right? Uh, prophecy where he was born, he was born in Bethlehem. A prophecy in Isaiah 53, he would die for our sins. He fulfilled that on the cross. He's a suffering servant. So number one, obviously, 
uh, the prophetic passages find their fulfillment in him. Number two is also pretty easy. Jesus fulfills the sacrificial system. This is what was wrong in old dispensationalism that sees the rebuilding of a temple with sacrifices. And I, I, I don't know if those ever part of mainstream dispensationalism, but they saw sacrifices for sins. Uh, that was, I think, pretty quickly changed that they were all thank sacrifices, but they were still sacrifices uh, in old dispensational theology. Um, Jesus fulfills the sacrificial system and I believe completely does away with it. So, for example, what was Leviticus about? If you just read broad strokes through the book of Leviticus, you get a couple of basic things. You get, you get the message that sin is really bad, right? You get the understanding of substitutionary atonement, that someone can die in the place of the sinner, and, and you get the idea of a priesthood that, um, that we can come, we, well, at least we can come to God, you know, there's going to be a priest there, but we, we can come to God and deal with our sins relative to God. Um, may, maybe that's not as strong a point as I want to make, but certainly Leviticus teaches the, the uh, holiness of God, that's a better way to say it, teaches the holiness of God, the horribleness of sin, and the mercy of God in allowing a substitutionary atonement. Let me make those the three points. That's easier. Holiness of God, horribleness of sin and its effects, death, and the mercy of God in allowing a substitute. Well, I remember when I, I preached just one sermon once on Leviticus, and I, I guess I probably didn't think about it too seriously, but I, I wanted them to see what Leviticus is about because who kills the animal in a sacrifice? The sinner does. Sinner slits the throat. You bring it up, there's a thing, your hands are placed on them, but the sinner kills the animal. And then the priest takes the blood and sprinkles it. So, I mean, that's, that's such a powerful picture. And I toyed with the idea of bringing in a fluffy and just holding it while I was talking. <laughs> But I figured I would have gotten fired on the spot for that, so I didn't do that. But um, it's, a, it's a different picture because you can't, according to the rules of Leviticus, you can't simply send your surrogate with your goat and say, yeah, whatever. You go. You kill it. You see the blood. And it's a reminder of the holiness of God, the horribleness of sin, and the mercy of God in allowing a substitutionary atonement. Okay, the whole sacrificial system is fulfilled on Calvary, isn't it? And that's why we don't sacrifice at all anymore. There was one sacrifice, book of Hebrews, there was one sacrifice once for all, um, don't need to do it again. So this entire sacrificial system was fulfilled in Christ. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it, if a church has an altar, it is completely and totally unbiblical. Amen. It's I just this, this whole idea of of an altar of mass uh, of of even calling it an altar in a Protestant church. I, I think it is it, theologically it's it's absolutely horrible theology. That yeah that the altar is the cross. It's non repeated, and there's nothing. People don't come to the altar. The altar's halfway around the world the other direction. Anyway. Number three. Jesus fulfills the food laws of clean and unclean. Okay, this is a whole big issue, isn't it? Uh, all the kosher laws are fulfilled in Christ. Uh, you get the Mark 7 passage. You get Paul's teachings and whatnot. There's some debate as to what was the purpose of food laws. You know, I remember reading in college that they were really all about health and, you know, you don't eat pork and, and stuff like that. Um, th there may have been some ancillary things going on in God's mind when um, he set up the kosher laws, but the fundamental purpose of the food laws was to establish the concept of clean and unclean. 
of that, that there are certain things that, that remove us from the presence of God, and there are other things that allow us to come into the presence of God. And in, in chapter 7 of, of Mark, this, this is where it's really discussed, and it's made clear that now it is not what is outside, it is what is inside. And, and I think you can argue that all along the cultic laws really were meant to people understand you're clean or unclean based on your heart, and it expresses itself certain ways, as in do you eat hooved or non-hooved animals, right? So all those food laws and everything they were teaching about clean and unclean and unclean people cannot live forever in the presence of God, you know, this kind of stuff, all of those kosher laws are fulfilled in uh, Christ. One of the biggest stupid mistakes I've ever made in my life was I was 30, and my brother had uh, gone home for between my first and second year of my PhD. My folks gave us some money because they knew we wanted to go to Israel. So David and I, my little brother, uh, went to Israel, and we just basically stayed in youth hostels and whatnot for a month and a half. We had a riot. And, but I, we flew into Tel Aviv on Friday night. Of course, Shabbat starts when you see three stars on Friday night. So we spent the night sleeping on the baggage things in the Tel Aviv airport. And then early the next morning, found an Arab taxi driver to take us to Jerusalem. He didn't care it was Shabbat. So we, we, we got into uh, Israel. And we were hungry and we ordered a pizza. I know we had we had to wait till three stars came out on Saturday night, and then the party begins in Israel. And so we were really hungry, and um, we we went to a pizza place. Do you know the worst tasting thing in the world is a Jewish pizza? Huh. Do you know why? Salty <laughs> not salty enough on the lips. <laughs> you shall not boil a kid in its mother's goat. You do not mix dairy and meat. So you either have a cheese pizza or you have a meat pizza with no cheese. They're, they're just terrible. And we're sitting there eating and they go, what is wrong? And they went, oh, kosher food laws. They can't mix it. Now, I mean, the, the original food law was a Canaanite practice of literally boiling a young goat in a mother's, its mother's milk is a form of worship. And that's the essence, I mean, that's why the law is there. You do not adopt religious practices that make you look like you're a Canaanite. Has all kinds of implications, by the way, on how we do worship. Ever walk into a church where you, you, you swear you're at a rock concert? Hmm. Adopting the forms of the world Anyway, won't go there. Um, anyway, so the, the kosher, uh, uh, the, the not mixing of the milk products and meat products comes out of the boiling a kid in small this milk. Anyway, anyway, all those food laws are gone. It's why I'm perfectly comfortable eating uh, meat, meat, cheese, cheese, pizzas. Anyway, Jesus fulfills those. Number four, and this is a little more theological. Christ fulfills the Old Testament in that he perfectly obeyed the law. Jesus' righteousness, remember from your theology, Jesus' righteousness is an earned righteousness, isn't it? Because he perfectly, fully obeyed the true intent of the law. Loving God, loving your neighbor. Now, he obviously did not obey, fulfill the, the uh, Pharisee's interpretation of the law. But he earned righteousness by being fully obedient to the law. In that sense, fulfills the law. He lived in perfect compliance with the true intent of the law. He died to satisfy the demands of the law. And the result was that he had earned righteousness and so fulfilled the law. So it, it is a, a theological way in which he fulfills the law. Okay? Point number five. We're, we're getting to the things I don't understand, but... And I, I don't have a, a, a label for this. 
is simply ask the question, what's the Old Testament? The Old Testament is the revelation of the character and the activity of God, right? That's what the Hebrew Scriptures are. It's a revelation of God's character. It's a revelation of, of His actions, what He has done, is doing, and is going to do. It's a revelation that He is holy and righteous and good. It's a revelation that His deepest desire is to be our God and we be His people. Okay, the, the Old Testament is a wonderful revelation of the character and the activities of God. And in, this, in that sense, Christ fulfilled the law because He is the most perfect, clearest revelation of the character and the will of God. In other words, the things that, that the Old Testament starts to help us understand about God comes to a point and Jesus gives us our fullest and clearest understanding of who God is. Now, I don't have a pithy label for that. I'll let you figure that one out. Okay, those are the, those are the, th those are the things that I'm comfortable with. Uh, there are a few other issues that I'm a little less comfortable with, and I, just, to, just to name a couple. Um, now, you had Professor Kaiser here, my old boss, last year, and uh, Walt is adamant on single fulfillment. Did you, were any of you in his class? Okay, adamant, isn't he? About, there's only one fulfillment of prophecy. I respect Dr. Kaiser. I really like him as a person, and I totally disagree with him on that point. But I do so carefully, all right? I'm a strong proponent in double fulfillment because I don't know how else to read some of the prophecies in the New Testament. Um, out of Egypt, I've called my son. Uh, it's, it's Hosea 11.1 1 is clearly pointing at God calling the nation Israel out of Egypt. I don't know how else to read Hosea 11.1. 1. And yet, what is true of Israel as a nation, God's son, is, is repeated in, more, in fuller and in more complete ways with God's single, I don't want to say real, but his single son. And so you see uh, Matthew especially being willing to look at how God relates to the nation of Israel and say the true fulfillment, while acknowledging, yes, God, Israel is God's son, and God pulled Israel out of Egypt, therefore out of Egypt I've called my son, is in new and in more complete and in more perfect ways true of, G of God's son Jesus. Okay, and so actions that start. This is how I think you have to handle Isaiah 7.14. In when, when I, a, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. Uh, the problem is both the Hebrew word behind virgin and parthenos in Greek, the Greek translation, does not primarily mean virgin. Uh, the word means a young woman of marriageable age. The assumption is that most young women of uh, marriageable ages are virgins. The problem is that parthenos is used of temple prostitutes. Well, last time I checked, they're not virgins. Huh. Checked. <laughs> Maybe I should use a different word. Well, the last time I thought through this and read about it, uh, you know, temple prostitutes aren't virgins. And in its historical situation, I think that the, that the, the virgin, the young woman, is Isaiah's wife. And the whole point is Isaiah is, is asking Ahab to ask God for a sign and Ahab, in total rebellion, says, I'm not going to ask for a sign. appears to be very religious. He's actually flat out sitting because he's not doing what God told him to do. And Isaiah says, phooey with you. What I just prophesied is going to come true before my son is of a certain age. And because they talk about a son being born. I think it's in the next chapter. Okay, so what on earth is Matthew doing? Well, Matthew understands that things that happen in the Old Testament are a type, if you want to use that word. They're the first revelate, the, the first going, you know, event, which is at a deeper, more fundamental level that Isaiah could never understand. Going to be fulfilled in God's Son Jesus, and so 
it, it's really hard because you can't, that's not, you can't put a footnote like that in the Bible. So the RSV got slammed for saying young woman, although it really is what's going on in Isaiah, but then it makes no sense in Matthew. So I, you have to say virgin in both places if you're an evangelical. Although, otherwise, Matthew doesn't make any sense at all. So I'm just saying, so it, it, I can see some of these kinds of connections. Okay. Where, where I am not sure are two areas. One is the promise of land. There are strong promises of land uh, in the Old Testament, right? That uh, I'm reading right this. I'm reading through Isaiah right now, and there's this all kinds of promises of the land that they're going to receive, and uh, I don't like the terminology, but I am again the exact opposite of Professor Kaiser. I I believe in replacement theology. I, it's not a good term, but I think I am a true descendant of Abraham. Uh, I think Paul says it so many times. I don't know how we miss this. That the the not it was interesting uh, in both the ESV and the NIV. Uh, this is one of my contributions because they both had, like in Romans two, the true is the true is Israelite or the true circumcision. The word true doesn't exist in the Greek. Circumcision is not at any level an issue of what we do physically. There's no true or partially true circumcision. Circumcision, Paul says, is a matter of the heart. And Paul is so radically redefining what a child of Abraham is that people have trouble with that, and so they put these words like true in that don't exist in the text. So uh, I, I believe that the land is heaven. Now, I'm not at a point where I'm willing to write an article and, and go to bat on it, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, because I look at the blessings that are promised in the Old Testament of a land and the peace that's going to come on the land. And I know some people put it in the millennium. I put it in heaven. But I'd raise that as a kind of a, when you talk about the Old Testament being fulfilled in Christ, you, you, you got the land promises. The hardest parts of the Old Testament to find a way that they focus in on Christ is all the theocratic rules. Israel was designed to be a theocratic, right? God is the head of Israel. And it's under that heading that you get the laws, the social laws about stoning the disobedient son. And <clears throat> I don't know how that law is fulfilled in Christ. I can see an argument that <clears throat> the attitudes that are behind a son being disobedient or the attitudes of the heart that are behind how a dad and a mom have to raise their children, that in some way they come to fulfillment in Christ and empowered by the spirits. I, I, don't, I, just, I don't know how to take the theocratic rules and, and have them fulfilled in Christ. So that's, that's for me, that's the big sticking point. But they have to be because Jesus says that the whole Old Testament is fulfilled in him. So there has to be some way this happens. Maybe Shriner knows I don't. Okay? But the point is, I don't, haven't come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. All of them come to a point in Christ. And in coming to a point in Him, some of them cease to be. Right? Sacrificial system. In others, they continue. That's why we read the Psalms. Other parts of it continue into the New Covenant because they are truer in deeper ways and empowered by God's Spirit in the New Covenant. That's, that's why I preach from the Psalms because they're fulfilled in Christ and they're not relegated to the Old Covenant that they're part of the New Covenant as well. Okay? That may not be, a, I, I wish I had all the answers, wouldn't that be nice? Sign up for a class here and get all the answers, but I don't have them. Any comments on that? So, <clears throat> I mean, so you don't break down the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the natural well, law, and the, the camps to kind of see that those are, are, are separated? 
I think those are, those are helpful distinctions. You just have to find a way to say they are fulfilled in Christ. The moral laws are, yeah, are, uh, depending upon what the moral is. The, the Jews didn't divide it up that way. That's part of the problem. So is stoning a disobedient son part of the moral law or not? But but stony, I would, yeah. I would, I would put that other more under a governmental type of law. Yeah. See, it's, it's, you, what you can say is anything that is involved in a theocratic state is abolished because we no longer live in a theocratic state. Well, and, and also Israel lived most of their life not in the theocratic state. And right. And everything still applies to them. Yeah. So... Yeah, there's no indication that when they were under the control of any other country, they weren't still supposed to stone a disobedient son. I mean, it, it, is, a fen- it is a phenomenally complicated, yeah, yeah. The, the Jews said, no, there's, these are the laws, and it didn't divide them up. We do the dividing up to try to come to terms with some of the laws. No. I don't understand. I don't understand why you would ever not want to see that because Paul saw it all over the place. Peter saw it. So why wouldn't we see it? <clears throat> and Dr. Kaiser will have an answer for that. I don't know what it is. But this was, I mean, he has really put a stake in the ground when it comes to no type, anti type, no double fulfillment. And he's a phenomenal scholar. So there's reasons behind it. I just, yeah, if, if, if Paul sees type, anti type, I mean, even the discussion in the commentaries on that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is presenting himself as the, as the new Moses, as the prophet that Moses prophesied, one like me is going to come. Well, that's not a double fulfillment. But you have a type and a type. You have Moses, and you have a Moses figure in Jesus. So, yeah. Dr. Kaiser's power, is as good as he is, has not convinced evangelicalism of that position. In fact, I, I'm sure there are people, but I don't know of major players that have agreed. Anyway, all things to struggle with. David. Can you uh, translate the Greek word to fulfill as to fully realize? <clears throat> that's, that's not a... <laughs> right, right. That's <laughs> high praise indeed. This is not, not a bad idea. Um, because, I mean, but see, there are specific prophecies, suffering servant prophecies, that are fulfilled. But I think when most of the church hears the word fulfilled, they're looking for, you know, Bethlehem of, you know, Ephrath or whatever it is, you know, the ruler is going to come out of you. you. They think of very specific, overt prophecies. And so that your idea of using to morph more fully realized um, is, I think, actually what the bulk of the Old Testament's doing. It is, you know, the sacrificial system's a great example. It is more fully, completely realized in Christ. You just made a distinction between the old mom and the young woman. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. And then the full realization of it yeah. would be Christ. Yeah. If to me, if you Matthew, is that when I use full realization, it kind of makes sense. Because kind of, for almost every place I count, the logo in Matthew, that's a good, solid thing. Yeah. Especially if any day people would say, I'm Matthew is making it up. Well, and, and, that's, and that's, that actually is the problem. People will look at Matthew and go, that's nuts. That's nuts. So, I don't, I'll, I'll mull that one over. That might be a... It'd be interesting to put a, a different translation of Plerao in Matthew and not elsewhere. Because Matthew is the only one you really have to worry about, I think. On the, well, on the NIV, I wouldn't get credit for it either. So. Actually, in your dictionary, you have realized your... Oh, Really? Wow, I'm better than I thought. No. <laughs> to realize it's not just, I, I fully realize because it's initially realized and now it's visible. Yeah. I did a paper on that, uh, but I did a DPS about five or six years ago, and uh, my, you know, I had a big trip I saw my son, and 
I looked up my uh, Martin Diedrich and Banker, and uh, it's a film, it's called Prophecy. It's only run about six minutes. Yeah. That was uh, yeah. really the kind of shot uh, to find that. Uh, you know, that, that's one of the meanings, but uh, by no means uh, are we limited to that. Yeah. Uh, I've read some of the papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think. Yeah, I'll take a look at it. Yes, sir. Matt, have you ever heard that? That if, if the prophecy was fulfilled beyond the lifetime of the prophet, he had to validate it with something had to validate it within his lifetime. Now I've I've never heard that, which doesn't mean it's not true. I've heard that, but I think the special pleading on his part of those who want the truth to be fulfilled. Yeah. That the sign points to the one fulfillment. Yeah. There's nothing in the text that, that says that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with a text that says that. Um Hmm. I, I'm I'm not familiar with that part of the passage. The only the only test for a prophet I know of is that if it didn't come true, you have to stone him. Which kind of negates the possibility of fulfillment past the lifetime, right? If it's not fulfilled, you kill him. You're like, oh, no, wait, guys, tomorrow's gonna happen tomorrow. Put those rocks down. You know, I don't know. Okay, this is a this is a, it's a very very difficult topic, and again. It, it's one that I think a preacher needs to work through because why do you, I mean, there are so many people that say, well, you know, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament, right? And you go, oh, so you believe in two gods? Or you believe that God changes? I mean, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a common thing that's said, and it's just horrific. That's why it's like an advertisement. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you've got you've to figure a way... To, to put those characteristics of God that are revealed in the, New, the Old Testament and, and, and mesh them with those maybe other characteristics of God of the New Testament. Although I'm not really sure there's really one characteristic in one that's also not in the other. God is every bit a God of wrath in the New Testament as He is in the Old. He's every bit a God of love in the Old Testament. As a, as, as a, as a mother hen puts its wings around its chicks, so often I've sought to protect you. I mean... You have these wonderful pictures of a loving, protective God in the Old Testament that, you know, to some people are more powerful than the ones we see in the New Testament. So, but there needs to be a way that you can say, uh, no, I will not participate in stoning a disobedient son other than getting him to move to Portland. Um, and this is why. So, sure. <laughs> well, that yeah, it'd be interesting to say is Jesus reinterpreting that particular law. the The problem is, I don't think the woman caught in adultery story belongs in the Bible. It, it's not in the original text. It doesn't appear till 150 years later. So, I uh, the commentators are almost unanimous in saying it's a, a real story. But John just didn't write it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So I tend not to go to textually on certain passages. Um, yeah, I just use that one because that's one of the strongest ones. I mean, the other one would be that homosexuality is a capital offense. It would be another kind of example that would, okay, now do we really believe that? Are we really going to do that? Okay, something for you to work on, but hopefully that some of the question may have been uh, answered in your mind. So there's, there's a, the vast majority of the New Old Testament, it's pretty easy to see how it's fulfilled in Christ. 
Uh, some of it is still murky. All right? All right. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then he's going to clarify what he means by the law and the prophets. He said, I'm, I mean every little thing they say. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, the NIV, not the smallest letter, the King James jot, I guess, right? Jot. Is it jot and tittle? Is that King James? Okay. I think not the smallest letter. It's the iota in the Greek alphabet. Uh, not the least stroke of a pen. There are, there are multiple Hebrew characters that look I, almost identical, except one has a little flip or another one the line connects. Like the, the H sounds, there's one that goes across and down and has a little line Number goes across and it connects. Uh, those with a little flip on it. So Jesus is looking at the smallest pen stroke that you would make writing Greek and the smallest pen stroke you would make writing Hebrew. All right. um, what does the ESV say? What do we end up with there? Dot. Why on earth would we say dot? There are no vowels. <laughs> There's no vowels written at this time. Where in the Hebrew language do you get a dot that's not a vowel? I do not remember our discussion on this. Oh, they give a Oh, shin sin. The, the shin sin tav, the last three letters in the Hebrew, the shin and the sin are distinguished by one as a dot over uh, the left and one as a dot over the right. That's where it is. <laughs> and there's always a reason. By the way, in translations, there's no random translation. It, it, doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter what any of the major translations, especially the ones done by committees, there's no random translation. There's always a reason. And it's so easy to look at, well, that's stupid. That didn't make any sense at all. Yeah, it did. It, there was a majority of scholars that are probably better scholars than you, than me, decided as a group that this is the way we do it. All right? Uh, and there's, sometimes they're not good reasons. Those would be all the votes I lost. Sometimes there are good reasons. Those are the votes I won. Um, but there's, there's always a reason. And so don't, don't stop your studying until you can figure out why. All right? So yeah, shin sin are are distinguished by a dot. That's that's where it comes from. Although I wonder if the dot was there in Jesus' day. It must have been, though. We wouldn't have said dot. Okay. Oh well. Well, the the, the letters. The, um, the second. Let me see what the Greek is. Um, within the promise coming to, to fulfill, for I am saying to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one Karayu will not pass away. Um, not, well, the Greek word is actually iota. So there, he's actually using the letter, the letter, and the other word is uh, Karaya. It means shoot. It crashed. Um, it means horn. Okay, that's where the that's where the that that's why we say it, it looks like a horn. Is what it is. So, yeah, I I don't like the translation dot. It, it's if it if it's a horn, it's it's the different than a he and a tet and whatever those characters are. Yeah. 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 But I don't like using English terms for Hebrew and Greek letters, though. I thought.
No, there's no dash in there's no dash in Hebrew. There's there's later on at the mass read she used dash to, to to build connections between words, but in the actual consonant alphabet there's not a dash. But Yeah, it's a stroke of the pen, but the only stroke of the pen that resembles a horn is that the little decorative thing. Anyway, anyway. Um I don't think it'd be hyperbolic because A, he's using the actual word iota, which is a Greek letter. And so the assumption is the other thing is, is a description of part of the Hebrew alphabet. So he's just saying absolutely everything is fulfilled in me. Absolute. So some way a stoning and disobedient son is fulfilled in Christ. I have no idea how. He means every last little thing Moses and the prophets say. Um, in other words, he's not allowing for some of it to be true and some of it to be ignored. Right? So when was the last time we preached through Numbers? Uh, Kent Hughes has a... Uh, has Kent ever come here to teach a class? I th- okay, I thought he had. Uh, he has this commentary series that he's the general editor for. And I can't imagine how hard it was to find someone who would preach through numbers so he could be a complete series. But he got someone. Anyway, but every, every last little bit of it is true. And he says, it's not that it's all... E- oh, I'm sorry. My crash took me away... It's not that all of the old covenant law is eternally going to go on. It's it's until everything is accomplished. So he's he's doing a terminus, which I guess is how um, it's it's how it's it's at some point. That why no? I was going to say. Let me just read it. I'm sorry. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means dis- disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And the point I'm trying to make is that some of it was accomplished on the cross. Some of it will be accomplished at judgment. Some of it will be accomplished in the new heavens and the new earth, right? So e- even the promises of land will have their ultimate final fulfillment and in the new heavens and the new earth. Make sense? So there, there is a... It doesn't have to all happen at once. Then what 19 does is that he's driving the point home with an application. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, that person will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands, both the greatest and the least, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Um, the idea of... I've got relaxes here. What The ESV, you know, I need to pull up the ESV. Some of my notes are still ESV. Yeah, yeah, verse 19 the ESV. Therefore, whoever relaxes, it's, it's, it's probably a better translation. Uh, relaxes means to set aside, to ignore, in other words. And so you have the basic Jewish distinction. Okay, there's 613 commandments, and the Jews divided them into the lesser and the greater, right? So greater commandments, love God, love your neighbor. Uh, lesser commandments, tithing, mint and dill and, and whatnot. And Jesus is saying, even those that are considered least are still tremendously important. And Jesus' confidence in the truth of the Old Testament extends even to the least, the most minor. The, the commandments of the Jews determined were most minor. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but uh, this is one of those passages that is brought up in discussions of inspiration, right? Uh, Most evangelicals believe in verbal plenary inspiration. Uh, Verbal meaning inspiration extends to the words, not just the ideas conveyed in them. Plenary means that the inspiration 
is to all of it, full. Plenary means, you know, full, complete. So most evangelicals believe that everything that Scripture says is true. There's a hybrid um, that says that Scripture is true in all that it affirms about faith and practice, but is not necessarily true in other areas such as history and science. When I was going to seminary, I went to Fuller, and this was, this was right smack in the middle of the debate. Uh, I remember sitting in chapel listening to the President Hubbard draw these distinctions out as to what Fuller's position was. Uh, true in areas of faith and practice, not necessarily true in other areas of faith and science. Um, a distinction that I think is, is impossible to maintain. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Is that inspired or not? Well, is it history or faith? Well, it's both, right? Our faith is grounded in history. It's just really, really hard to, to split these things out. And it's in the history of the debate back in the 70s when Jewett, who was, by the way, a phenomenal systematics professor. I enjoyed his class. Uh, a godly godly man but his book was the death knell for that area that that slice of evangelicalism when he said um, that uh, that Paul was wrong about women in ministry he just was wrong he was limited by his rabbinic background and Jewett argued that Paul was wrong in an area of faith and practice and and uh, that that's, that's when the divide between Fuller and their adherents really separated from Trinity and Gordon Conwell and Denver and their adherents. So that was going on in the 70s. Um, but anyway, uh, Jesus is, uh, as I was trying to make up, I'll tell you the story. I, when I was in grad school, my two best friends were Daryl Bach and Craig Blomberg. Daryl teaches at Dallas, went to Dallas. Uh, Craig teaches at Denver, went to Trinity. And we had Thursday lunches together. And Daryl would come in from where he lived. And actually, Craig and I lived together for a while. And we would have lunch and then argue all afternoon. It was the best part of my education. And I did not realize that I had been taught a certain way at, at Fuller. And they had really been taught differently. So I just went into grad school assuming the Bible had errors. Well, I wasn't taught that growing up, but I just assumed based on everything that there were heirs. And, and that was one of the things that we really, they challenged me on. And this was one of the passages they go to. They say, Bill, if Jesus' confidence in the truthfulness of Scripture extends to the jot and tittle, why doesn't yours? Oh, <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. So this is a very important passage in the whole debate uh, on inspiration. But Jesus' confidence extends to the smallest possible part of the Old Testament law. Okay? Okay, so at this point, the Pharisees are going, oh yeah, this guy's not bad. I'm not really sure what this fulfilled business is, but, you know, hey, this, he's, 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 he's one of us. He's one of us. And then verse 20. And uh, verse 20 would have just decimated them, right? For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses, um, ESV is exceeds that of the absolutely most meticulously religious people the world has ever known. That of the Pharisees and the scribes and teachers of the law, you will, and in a very emphatic Greek instruction, you will certainly not. Um, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Actually, the NIV is a lot better than the ESV on that. ESV is you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, NIV is it makes it more emphatic. You will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow, what a zinger that must have been! That all of a sudden here's this Galilean prophet saying that the most meticulously religious people probably the world has ever seen 
are not even in the kingdom of God. Much less they're not great, they're not least, they're not even in it. And Jesus' call to the disciples is that your righteousness must surpass, it must exceed these people. Now what he's going to do then is he's going to spend the rest of the chapter unpacking what that means. This is Dr. Bill Mounts in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. This is session number 5 on Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 through 20 on Jesus and the Law. Mm -hmm. 